Uh, welcome back. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's Nate and Sunny here, back with another episode of Conspiratus. As promised, we're back one week later, just like we said we would be um, <laughs> on time as usual. How's it going, Sunny? Uh, it's going pretty well. How about you? Quite good. Quite good. I'm off school. I'm getting back into the game, uh, and I'm excited to be talking. Cool. What was your last few weeks of uh, school like? Um, finals, and also pretending that I've been reading papers. Um, <laughs> blockchain stuff so i can when i jump back into it i'm i'm ready to go how about you what have you been up to um mostly just dealing with uh cosmos stuff for the most part some of my validator stuff there's new york blockchain week or took up uh you know that was a fun exciting week um cool yeah. what cosmos stuff any cosmos stuff of note as of recent <laughs> uh yeah so I, I guess what you're implying is we had this like interesting hard fork that happened uh this week I've only heard whisperings, but yeah. Whisperings. What went down? So something interesting happened. So we actually found our first bug in the uh, code base. Uh, <laughs> bug. <laughs> it's a, it's, yeah, it's a bug. It's a vulnerability. Um, you know, we, we deemed it high se severity, which, you know, I think it's fair. So essentially what the bug is, is that there was a way for you to unbond without waiting the unbonding period. Interesting. So, to clarify, a validator's bonding, or was this if you were delegating to someone, you could undelegate immediately? If that's allowed, right? That's not supposed to be allowed. If you're delegating oh, to someone, you're supposed to be able to. You have, you're supposed to have to wait the full. Th uh, we see. have a three week unbonding period, and so people are able to unbond without waiting the entire three weeks. And how it worked is so you know how we only have the top hundred validators are active validators, right? And, but sure. you can have a validator candidate who's like in waiting to try to get into the top 100. Can I guess? Yes. So you, if you undelegated or you delegated to someone else and you weren't a top 100 validator, you were able to withdraw instantly. Yeah, exactly. And so, cool. and you know how there's this feature we have called instant redelegation? Sure. So if you're delegated to a validator in the top 100, you can instant redelegate to someone not in the top 100 and then unbond immediately. Wow, that's crazy. Um, yeah. Oh, so I see. So, so if you are not necessarily a validator, if your tokens are bonded in general, you instantly redelegate to someone out, and then you leave immediately. Exactly. Wow, that's crazy. And so this bug came into us anonymously. We don't know who it was. I guess we know their address, but uh, yeah. How do you know their in. address? Uh, they sent in a. Uh, so we we found out about it. Uh, someone sent an email to us at security at tenderman .com. And they so they attached uh, one ad one transaction that they did that included that the the, oh. the, the the attack and then so we wrote a script to scan the chain. Uh, if anyone else has done it, there were eight transactions that had done it, but all from the same address. So it's just that the, the initial uh, person who disclosed the vulnerability to us, and so we deem this a high severity because if you think about it in a way, it does somewhat undermine the security of proof of stake. Right, like if seeming seemingly like totally like it seems like pretty much everyone would be able to leave effectively without yes. getting slashed. Yeah. Right now, they're yeah. Essentially, it opened up nothing at stake. Right. Yeah. And the other thing is, it could also do is delegate validators could just completely grief their delegators by unbonding immediately and then just slashing all their delegators. The, there is this thing called min self bond, which is like a val in the code, a validator can say, oh. If I go below this min self bond, you know, auto unbond all my validators, all, all my delegators, which auto is fine. Auto undelegate all the delegators or auto uh, unbond them? Those are the same thing. I see. Okay. Yeah. And so that's there, but most validators actually have their min self bond set to zero, uh, including Zika. So I don't know. It, that, that just seems to be something that everyone kind of figured, oh, we'll set later. And I don't think anyone's gotten around to it yet. I actually proposed to everyone, hey, let's like, you know, in the next couple of weeks, let's all make sure we increase our min self bonds. When when did you, when did when was the security vulnerable? When did they send you the email? Tuesday last week. Oh, wow. Oh, so you've known for a bit. Yeah, yeah. And so we, hard, so, okay. So we hard forked. Yeah. We in control hard forked. Yeah. The, the Cosmos community decided to hard fork. <laughs> Good rephrase. Um, <laughs> and so you know, normally you know you want the validator to you know it takes them three weeks to unbond so that gives delegators time to notice that their validator is like doing something sketchy right but here if the validator can just unbond immediately and then they can just undelegate you know 
You know what I mean here? But, sorry, so is the griefing opportunity here just that they would lead to, like, the delegators not getting any money, or they somehow have the ability to actually cause them to lose funds? Like, actually get slashed? Yeah, the validator can immediately unbond all their tokens except for maybe Oh, their own one. their own tokens. I see. Yeah. This is why. They're self-bond. The, got you. Okay. So the validator unbonds their own tokens, but then they equivocate with the things that isn't theirs but is delegated to them, getting mm -hmm. that slashed without any of their stuff slashed. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, that's that's pretty crazy. Yeah, that sounds, high. That sounds like, like high security. Here's my opinion of it. I think it is a theoretically very catastrophic bug, but something that's practically not the biggest deal i think you know any validator that does this today will I, I you know i think there's something more that they have at stake than just their personal stake right there's their reputation at stake and i also think that you know yes i agree it kind of technically undermines proof of stake security but that would, I, I actually doubt anyone was actually going to figure to to abuse it i and so so let me tell you exactly what, what happened right so tuesday we find out about the bug and so we write a patch to fix the bug. And it we decided that what we're going to do is immediately uh, do a, 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 a hard fork at a certain block height, which is about the next day at, so Wednesday, Wednesday? No, Thursday at 6 p.m. So it took us about a day to write the patch. Gotcha. And so Wednesday uh, mm -hmm. around noon, we started inviting as many validators and reaching out to them as possible, as many validators as possible, saying that, hey, like, here's this vulnerability we found. And we kind of told them and that, okay, we're planning at this block height on Thursday evening to execute a hard fork. And you have to upgrade your node. And it, and and so the thing is, the way ten, this, this has to be done as a soft fork. It doesn't really work as a hard fork, unfortunately. What do you mean? Um, there wasn't a way to, the, because of a way that how Tendermint works right now, it actually couldn't have been done as a soft fork. It had to, it can only exist as a hard fork. Oh, right sorry. Now. I thought you said the opposite. Okay. So it, it oh, had to be a hard fork. That's it had to be a hard fork. I, I think in the future, we'd like to maybe modify Tendermint. So it's possible to execute this in a soft fork, but for now it was hard, only hard forkable. Um, and so... Yeah, so we ex we we told that to all the validators. All the validators kind of came on board. Then the next day on Thursday, so we kind of got approval from all the validators first. Interesting. And then the next day at around Thursday at noon uh, Pacific time, we disclosed the vulnerability publicly, like beyond just the validators. And sure. we like you know push it out on all the Cosmos channels on Riot Telegram for. Forum. I even uh, made a proposal on the Cosmos Hub governance itself, disclosing the vulnerability. Um, and so from that point, we had about six hours left until the hard fork block height. And so that way, you know, I think with it, we had, it, we'd been able to reach out to like 90% of the validators uh, manually, like, like, like before that. And then after that, you know, those t last 10% 10, 10, 10 of the validators, you know, we didn't have contact information for. Some yeah. of them are anonymous. And so they only had about six hours to uh, do the fork. Did they? Do you know if they managed mm -hmm. to switch so, over? Yeah. So when, by the time the hard fork kite came around, uh, I think most of them actually did switch over. Um, I don't know how many switch over. So, so basically at the, at the hard fork block height, everything went smoothly. Nothing mm -hmm. happened until a couple... Uh, like half an hour, an hour later, someone did an exploit transaction, and that's where the hard fork happens. And all the nodes that were, I think there were about 10, eight or eight, no, there were about eight nodes that didn't get the notification yet and didn't upgrade. And there was actually a few who thought that they upgraded their node properly, but maybe they misconfigured something or whatnot. And so they actually crashed too. So at that point, out of 100 validators. So, by, by the way, the, the, the percentage of voting power that was on the new fork was like 90, over 95% or so something, that, right? So that that seems reasonable only because you imagine that the people who have like, you know, a large portion of the voting power, you're able to contact, right? Those are the ones who you have, the, the little ones are the guys you probably can't get, get in touch exactly. with. Exactly, especially the anonymous ones, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Which is interesting and, and yeah. noteworthy, right? Yeah, 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 definitely. And... But, and so, you know, people don't get slashed for being down until almost currently almost like 18 hours after. You, you have to be down for like 18 hours straight to actually get a slash. And so by that time, within the 18-hour window, I think 
96 validators had come online. I think only four validators were uh, slashed for not being online. Wow, that's crazy. It's really interesting that you approached the validators first. I mean, I yeah. guess the whole Cosmos thing that you buy into mm -hmm. is that the validators control which direction the chain goes, but um, six hours to educate yourself about said hard fork and make a decision seems small. Um, I agree. Yeah, and like, so I guess the question is like, do you remember the, the parody bug last year where they forgot to check signatures or something crazy? Yep. Do you know about when, when that occurred, do you know if the critical fix was announced to the community at the same time as the miners or was it miners mm -hmm. leading followed by? No, no, because it was, they, they reached out to the miners and exchanges and everyone before they reached out to the public community. The, the and and, and they, did, they did the same thing as we did where they actually didn't disclose the vulnerability. They released the code patch uh, and we, we did the same thing. We didn't disclose the vulnerability, like ex walk people through what sure. the exact bug is. <laughs> but we sense. said, and, you know, when that came out, I remember me and my friend Chris, like as soon as the code came out, we like went looking through the Git logs and we're like, okay, we found the bug. Here it is. This is what it was. Remember, me and you did the same thing with the uh, parody hack, is the, the parody multisig bug as well. So Chris. you mentioned you mentioned earlier before we hopped on that you weren't totally satisfied with the hard fork, though. I just, you know... I, I think, you know, I think we should admit, like, say a lot of things did go well. Like, you know, we clearly hard fork and fixed the thing. It was quick. Yeah, so I'm just some wondering whether maybe it was worth maybe doing, you know how, like, the Zcash bug, when they had this, like, crazy bug that allowed anyone to mint money, right? Maybe what we should have done, what they did was they kind of just kept it completely under wraps. And the next time they upgraded the chain and like a normal hard fork they just added that fix in patch in as well and then after the hard fork the regularly scheduled hard fork they kind of disclose oh this is the bug that we patched by the way by the way we saved you guys yeah no it's yeah it's, what's crazy is that like earlier you were saying like i don't know how actually extreme this this cosmos bug was and my first reaction exactly. was oh you know it sounds horrible and introduces nothing at stake but realistically, it seems a lot less worse than anyone being able to mint coins and us not being able to see it, you know? Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. And and my opinion of this was that, it, you know, maybe it, it's such a small, minor bug it, in a practical sense that maybe it was okay. First of all, no one else had found it other than this one person who disclosed it. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a very weird bug. Like, you have to be really well-versed with the code. Uh, in order to find that bug, and so sure. it would be nice to know who the who the disclosure was. But so yeah, uh, given that, I don't know I think maybe we could have gone gotten away with just doing the secret packs like that. But maybe it's good practice for a really much more critical bug in sure. the future. I sure. don't know. Yeah, I mean it's impressive that you could could pull it off in such a short time span. Although the level yeah. of coercion of the nodes of the network who aren't validators to me is a, a little bit disturbing, I will admit. Um, yeah. Because it seems like if you're a regular user, realistically, to actively make a decision in this hard fork, you're required yeah. to, I mean, obviously it's a clear decision here, but imagine yeah. if this is something different. You, you'd you have to be online in those six hours, you know what I mean? It's, right, exactly, yeah. Uh, Binance's nodes did crash, and so they had to restart their nodes with oh, the wow. new code. So uh, I guess we, we, we sent them a memo beforehand, the hard fork, uh, along, like, you know, when, when we sent to the validators, we also sent it to a number of, you know, we'll call them important nodes or something. Yeah. Um, but they didn't upgrade in time. So, I don't know, what, what, what are your thoughts on this from, like, an outsider's perspective? You know, we were, you know, I was kind of, like, in the heat of the moment, and it's kind of, like, stressful and stuff. What, like, knowing what you, what I told you so far, what do you think about how we handled it? Yeah, um, I would say that, your, your first impression of, I don't know how serious of a security vulnerability it is, to me, I would push back against, just because mm -hmm. it relied on the whole um, reputation-based argument that can solve any nothing-at-stake problem. So <laughs> saying, oh, yeah. you know, they have a reputation to worry about is something you can say for any proof-of-stake chain, and so saying it here is, like, kind of, it's seemingly vacuous yeah. to me. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, it still seems true. Like, I don't think Polychain Capital, realistically, is going to get all their people slashed just for lulls. Like, it seems like they probably won't do that. Um, yeah. So I'm hesitant to rely on that argument, but I also still think the argument's in some sense right. Um, and given given the level of the security vulnerability, I don't really know what else you can do. Um, so here's one distinction between your your case and Zcash's case. I believe in Zcash's case, they found the bug internally, whereas yours was coming from the outside. Yeah. Given that it was reported, it seems like they're probably not too evil, but you never can really tell, right? So it's right. 
it's I, I think mm -hmm. from what I can tell, you guys are young enough that can we really fault you? It's the first real security vulnerability. But quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, did you guys get an audit of like the staking code? Uh, I believe so, yeah. Interesting. Um, wasn't found. I guess not. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, our code is very complex and it's like, it's, it's not even like a, it's not even like a, the, the fix was so simple. You should look at the fix. It's like two lines of code. Yeah. It's like, it's yeah. a couple lines of code. Yeah. I bet. Yeah. Um, it's just like a logical error where it's like, oh, we didn't consider that like, wait, if you instantly redelegate it to an unbonded. Yeah. Yeah. And so we just made it. So no matter who you're unbonding from, you still have to wait three, three, three weeks. That's it. That's really interesting. So quick question for you. Um, yeah. Having written actual live proof of stake code in some sense, being involved in that code writing process, do you yeah. think that it's inherent to proof of stake that we're going to end up with complex code that has these kind of finagly bugs like this? Because, I mean, one one of the proof of work advocates frequently say it's just so simple. Like how complicated it's so proof simple. of stake is. It is simple. <laughs> yeah. Realistically, Tendermint is like you know simpler than the protocols that came before it, and hopefully you know Casper claims to be even simpler still. But do you think it's like baked into proof of stake that we're just going to have you know complex as hell mechanisms that are buggy as hell also? So this has this stuff doesn't actually have much to do with uh, Tendermint and Casper and consensus protocol, right? This has completely just to do with the staking mechanisms, which is very very separate. Um, and so I you know I haven't really seen what Casper or the Ethereum team is doing when it comes to staking mechanisms and stuff and you know i think i mean you know one of the features i pushed for very heavily and i, I kind of like really championed this feature was that instant redelegation yeah. thing totally. and so you know if that instant redelegation feature didn't exist this bug wouldn't have exist existed but at the same time i think that instant redelegation feature is important so important to like the uh decentralization of proof of stake so you know i think it comes with trade-offs yes yeah, like you're Basically, we're giving additional features and security and decentralization properties, but it does come at the risk of more complexity. And so, um, yeah, it, it comes. That's tough. Yeah. So, so I think at some point we convinced ourselves mm -hmm. that the instant redelegation thing was something that you needed to have in protocol if you were going to have it at all, right? Like for it to work, it needs to. Be, you can't do it. You can't simulate it through a smart contract. No, no, yeah. I've had this discussion with Dan Robinson a couple of times, and I've convinced him multiple times, and he always forgets about what I said, and then I have to <laughs> explain it to him, and they're like, "Oh yeah," and then I show him the last time I showed it to him. He's like, "Oh yeah," I had the the same exact road to Damascus okay, I, moment. I'm, I guess I'm pulling a Dan Robinson right now, but can you? Is there a like intuitive reason that you can give me off the top of your head as to why mm -hmm. the instant redelegation needs to be in protocol? Yeah, because when someone instantly redelegates you need them to still be slashable for the faults of the old validator. So they're put into a pseudo unbonding period where like it's put into a three week unbonding period where it's like, oh, during this time, you're still slashable for the old person's faults. Sure. And yep, so that yeah. requires some level of global state in the staking mechanism. Right. So you and, can't and just have every validator have their own delegation contract. Yeah, totally makes sense. Um, and the reason that the instant delegation, just, you know, it's been a while since I've thought about it. The reason that the instant delegation is beneficial is that, like, if you're not necessarily worried about your validator saying, uh, you know, oh, I'm going to slash you, but instead you're just worried, oh, they're raising their commission rates, Yeah, you might want to get out. But yeah. I guess my question is, it seems like that, okay, so take this. Imagine that you're not worried about the validator slashing, the validator, imagine I'm delegating to you, and I'm mm -hmm. not worried about you slashing me, but I think you might be doing something else nefarious, like going offline or... Um, uh, you know, raising interest rates, for example, taking more money from me. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that those things are both things that could be addressed mm -hmm. through other mechanisms other than instant delegation? Um, so what's an my example? example, my example with interest rates is if the interest rates are a parameter in a smart contract, we could say mm -hmm. that can only change, you know, 10% a year or something. And then so, we're... So what we have right now in the Cosmos code is that validator, these are all parameters the validator self-declare and it's enforced in the code. So for example, a validator can say, oh, this is the maximum my commission rate can go. This is the maximum rate of change of my commission rate, et cetera, et cetera. And these are all things that are there in code. But, you know, I think, and so, you know, that's one of the things delegators should look at when they are uh, delegating to validators. Sure. But at the same time, I'll admit that Sitka currently has our maximum commission rate at 100% <laughs> and our maximum rate of change at 100%. 
uh, because we've made a personal promise, staked our reputation on it to our delegators saying that, hey, we're not going to cha- make any changes to the delegation uh, without three weeks of notice. So we'll publicly disclose it on Twitter and Telegram and all of our communication channels before we make any changes to our commission rate. And and so, you know, if we make a change, if we if we say that we want to make a change to it, we that that instant redelegation gives our delegators time to move away from us. Fair enough. I, here's here's, I guess, my point that I'm trying to make. I would push back and say instant redelegation does. If you want the benefits of instant redelegation, you can mm-hmm. obviously get them through instant redelegation. Yes. I, I might argue that um, there are other ways to get those benefits, namely mm-hmm. like smart contract based things that can simulate let's say at least most of the benefits of instant redelegation. And the yeah. benefit here now is that um, if you know if instant redelegation does get screwed up or what we have that simulates it does get screwed up, it doesn't require this six hour hard fork, right? So, so, but, but, but here's the other thing, right? It's about uh, unstickiness of the validator set where if you don't have, so here's the, here's the alternative. You don't have instant redelegation, right? Let's say there's a new up and comer va- validator who like maybe wasn't in the validator set yet, but you know, they're really, Great validator, right? Now, as a delegator, maybe I want to delegate to them. But to do that, I would have to unbond, wait three weeks of unbonding where I don't get any rewards, and then bond to the uh, new validator. Now, maybe, you know, maybe they're a better validator, but like, I'm not willing to do that three weeks of no rewards just to do that. Now, with the instant redelegation, I can instantly move that and not actually lose out on those rewards. And so this helps make the validator set less sticky, which is really, you know, that's, that's my biggest worry when it comes to proof of stake. I don't want validator sets to be sticky. If there's better validators that come along, I want people to redelegate towards them. Cool. Two questions. The first one is, are, is that a commitment from Sika that if a better, if a better validator set comes along, will you gratefully mm-hmm. cede your, uh, your delegation to them? Uh, I just let's just lock it in now, you know. If someone who's like so much better than you comes along, you should give up, give up immediately, you know. Don't make um, it sticky. Yeah, well, you know, it, <laughs> you mean you mean with sick as personal atoms? Yeah, sick, yeah, of course, of course. Oh, I would know, um, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, maybe if the you know it better has to take into account their commission rate and stuff, which and lots of other things. Uh, but yeah, you know, I mean, like so, Sika is like for now, most of our atoms are are. All of our atoms are uh, delegated currently to our own validator. We had a thousand that are uh, delegated to another validator called Anonymous Ninja, uh, because they they were the uh, first anonymous validator Very to cool. enter the Cosmos staking system, and we were just like, oh, that's really cool. We want to like support this, and so we we, we threw them a thousand atoms, which is like you know almost like three percent of all of our atoms. So that that, that was good. I recently was on the Cosmos Block Explorer for reason X, Y, and Z, uh, and I noticed that this anonymous validator that you just mentioned, uh, what was it, anonymous.ninja or something? Something like that. Yeah, um, anonym.ninja. Yeah, has, has been down recently. Uh, yes. and I And as well as some other validators, like I think uh, Polychain we mentioned was, uh, was down uh, as well. And I, you know, Google Cloud happens to be down today. What are your <laughs> thoughts? Yeah, so... So, yeah, like I said, we actually just, so we actually redelegated away from Anonymous Ninja, like right before the hard fork, because they were one of the validators we were having trouble contacting. And so I was worried like, oh, what if they don't upgrade their node on time? And so I actually, we actually redelegated away from them for that reason, which, you know, kind of goes back to the, I don't know if that was a good idea. That that, that seems like an unfair, it yeah. unfairly it, hurt that it, Anonymous it Validator. Definitely disenfranchises Anonymous Validators. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, but, you know, they were able to come back online. They, they were actually not, they were one of those few that didn't come online at the thing, but they came in within that 18 hour window. Cool. Um, so that's good. Uh, and so, by the way, if you think about it, they really had 24 hours to come back online, not just six hours, you know? Yeah, sure. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is you could imagine a mechanism whereby, like, when there is a hard fork, like when there is a thing that would kick your node offline, you mm-hmm. extend that offline period to uh, two days or something, three days. Um, that is just, actually a really good idea. I did not consider that. That's okay. Yeah. That's a good idea. You could have a, a flag that's like, you know, give them a bit because this was an extenuating circumstance. They're trying their best here, you know. That's a really good idea. Okay, I will. If you want, you can make the, uh, if you'd like, you can make the issue on 
uh, GitHub oh, or up. make a proposal on the Cosmos Hub. Even more exciting. I, yeah, yeah. I'd love to. I'd love to troll Cosmos governance. <laughs> That'd be cool. Anyway, so back to what you were talking about. Yes. So now you know. This a couple days later after the hard fork, everything seems to have gone fine after that. Sorry, rip those four validators who got jailed for a little bit. Um, <laughs> but now today, as you mentioned. Google uh, Cloud was down, and you know we were actually worried right before this episode. We we rec- we record using uh, Google Hangouts. We actually used Epicenter's like Google Hangout subscription. Uh, but so yeah, a couple of validators, I think five validators, all crashed at the same time. And so we, I was looking at them, and it, you know it just happened. It probably has something to do with the Google Cloud outage, and it might have to do with you know maybe they're actually running their validators in the cloud, for example. Uh, you know, I know I know there are some validators who do do that, and there's also, or it's possible maybe all of their sentries were on a all on Google Cloud. So can you can you quickly explain the difference between a sentry and a validator? Yeah, sure. So a validator is my node that has my hotkey that's actually doing all the signing of blocks, right? It's, and then a sentry. What sentry is basically? I don't want my validator to be publicly accessible on the internet. Right. Uh, because that makes it easy for people to DDoS it. So what I'll do is I'll have these sentry nodes, which are nodes that are like, I connect my validator to these nodes in the peer-to-peer network, and then these nodes are connected to the wider peer-to-peer network. Great. And I have multiple sense. sentry nodes. I have a uh, across different clouds, uh, cloud infrastructure, and I even have a private sentry node, which is not like connected to the direct peer-to-peer, ne- public peer-to-peer network. It's connected... Uh, only to certain friendly validators that I have personal relationships with. Oh, well, uh, and you're saying Sika, yeah. personally Sika has in multiple clouds in this private Yes, one. yes, yes. Uh, and something we haven't done yet, but it's on, it's on the work, is we're trying to create a script that like automatically detects when nodes go down, uh, centuries go down. Because currently, if that happens, we have to manually spin them up. Uh, we want it so that if they go down, boop, it's just like a hydra. It just like pops up more. That's really the goal here. Um, and so yeah, that's kind of the situation. And so it turns out these five validators, they probably were either running their validator node in the cloud or they were running all of their sentries only on Google Cloud. And so they basically got partitioned off of the network. Well, I, I've heard Vitalik in the past make arguments for um, collective punishments in some sense. Like, uh, you know, the more nodes that are offline, the more it hurts any individual node to be offline. Uh, and this seems like a fantastic example of where this would be value, valuable, right? Why would Everyone, this be valuable here? Why, why should Sika get punished because Polychain is using Google Cloud? So, so not Sika's online still, yeah? Yes. So Polychain and those other people who aren't Google Cloud, in some sense, should mm-hmm. be punished for essentially correlating their faults oh, yes, with other yes. people. Absolutely. Yeah. This is like something yeah. that... Uh, uh, we definitely want to implement ASAP in Cosmos is this like partial slashing, but especially like super duper slashing for um, correlated faults. So yeah. that's an incentive for people to uncorrelate their validators. Yeah, totally. And it's a huge incentive to not also be on Google Cloud yeah. or AWS or any of the, you know, kind of yeah. popular boys. Which so I, I thought you meant like, you know, let's also punish all the online validators as well because the, 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 the total online power is not 100%. I agree with that statement, although I don't think that this specific example argues for it. Sure. But, uh, yeah. Well, if you agree with that statement, why do you... Okay, so back to the question. Why should the online validators be punished because some validators are not doing that well? Great example. Um, you would love this script that uh, spins up your sentries when they're uh, mm-hmm. unfortunately DDoSed by who knows who on the internet. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, unfortunately you haven't written the script yet. So, if I was some, you know, say malicious validator who wanted to yeah. kind of I mean, you're top, your top five validator at this point. You can imagine mm-hmm. there might be some warring factions who want some of your delegated coins, and they start dosing all these entries just to make sure, um, or just to try to kick you out and get access to your delegated tokens. Uh, right. The point being, censorship by these nodes, these DDoS attacks are essentially free in protocol if you don't punish everybody when mm. a- any one person is offline, mm. right? Also, actually, while you were saying that, it also gave me another idea is, let's say I do write this script. It actually is an incentive for me to open source it and give it to other validators to use as well. Um, if there are these incentives or if there aren't these incentives? If there are, what you're saying, if that yes. was there, it's an incentive yes, for me totally, to open absolutely. source Oh, my... that's really interesting. Oh, wow, that's so cool. So, so <laughs> because you want, oh, wow, yeah, because you want everyone else to be online, 
it's in your best interest to open source the code that helps everybody be online. Yeah, that's, that's actually kind of cool. Dope. That's pretty cool. I, did, yeah, I never really cool. thought about that, but that's okay. Yeah, we usually we usually think about these incentives as discouraging people from attacking each other, but actually it's encouraging people to help each other directly. Yeah, that's cool. Huh. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a proposal for Cosmos governance just so I can get access to your script for no other reason. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. Yeah. If you want, I can. Uh, yeah. Let me know. I can help you out. Show you how to make the proposals. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to see. So, as someone, so you said you mentioned that during the hard fork, you made a proposal to the the governance thing to let everyone know. Have you two questions? Have you made proposals before? And also, how hard is it? I've never made a proposal. How hard would it be for me to go and make a proposal? Uh, so yeah. So what I made actually on the hard fork, it was kind of less of a governance proposal. I was kind of using it for two purposes. I was using it basically. What I said was, this government, this proposal did three things. It did, number one, it acted as a bulletin board for me to basically say, oh, here's this vulnerability, right? We posted it on the Cosmos forum, on Twitter, on Telegram, on Riot. But, you know, if you think about it, those are all centralized side channel services that well, sure. people are expected to follow. The Cosmos Hub governance is one thing that everyone is expected to be able to see. So that it acted as a bulletin board for that purpose. Two, we it acted as a signaling mechanism. So in the proposal, I said, please vote yes after you have upgraded your node and so that gave a that gave a view into okay this is how many people have upgraded are we beyond the 20 the 66 percent threshold and whatnot so that was useful in that way and then finally it was a way of saying that uh so th we have this thing called deposits which is you know you need to put a deposit on a proposal before it's that re votable by everyone and if a proposal is spam or something people can vote something called no with veto which will slash the which will burn the deposit and so what what we said is that like i said because we didn't actually explain the bug where we did the original disclosure uh what we what we said was hey here's this new patch that we want to fix it to uh and uh we a disclosure of the actual vulnerability will come out within a couple of days and here's our commitment saying that we the people People who are familiar with the disclosure may deposit on this proposal in order to put basically a proof of stake, showing that oh we're 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 putting these atoms and saying like we legitimately think this is an important thing to uh, do and so to, to do this and so you know uh, Sika did this Occlusion, which is another validator uh, run by Zaki Manian uh, and some others they they deposited on it I think. Uh, there were a couple of other validators as well cool. who put who basically were familiar with the disclosure and wanted to put their stake behind it. And so basically, we said that after the disclosure comes out, if you think that you know something was sketchy or malicious about this, please slash vote. Us. Yeah, no with veto in order to slash us. Sure. So those are the three purposes of that proposal. It wasn't so much. It wasn't a traditional governance proposal. Yeah. It's not like we were saying, "Oh, do we want this hard fork or not?" It was kind of a theory that okay, this hard fork is happening. Can we like here's like a way of making it more public and giving a little bit more legitimacy to it. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and so, yeah. So How this hard is, is it, though? It's I, I'm, I'm imagining, I'm imagining yeah. command line tools. I'm imagining uh, that me as a, me as a, you know, <laughs> someone who's bad at using command line tools is going to struggle to, uh, you know, upgrade the Cosmos network. Eh, it's not that bad, actually, because it, we, I, so I actually don't know if there's a wallet called Looney, Looney.io. Uh, I am actually not sure if they have the ability to submit governance proposals on the thing. I know they have the ability to deposit and, uh, oh yeah, they do. Looney.io. Uh, you, you can How create you L U N I E dot I O. Cool. In the governance tab, there's a button at the top, right? That says create proposal and you can create your proposal there and you have to put a deposit of atom, but you don't have to put the entire deposit yourself. It needs 512 atoms to get move to the voting period uh but you can crowdsource that so you can make the proposal right. and then you have two weeks to get more people to deposit on it for as well and yeah. so yeah you can go ahead and make a proposal uh sika has made uh one proposal in the past so far which got passed um that propo that proposal was basically earlier if you vote no on a proposal the the money the deposit also gets slashed and so we, 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 we propose to change it so only if it gets vetoed does the thing get slashed. Because otherwise that would discourage certain types of like, you know, pretty 
just because yeah. something is contentious. If, if you're not, if you're not totally sure that it's going to pass, you're not going to want to put up the proposal in the first place, which isn't shouldn't be how governance is. Right. right that kind of defeats the whole point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Makes sense. So yeah, that yeah, the, the, the governance mechanism. It's I don't know. It's very interesting. Like you know, the Cosmos community is very young, and we're still learning our way in the world. You seem, at least from the outside, uh, I would say you're probably my main interface to the Cosmos community. But at least from the outside, it seems fairly, like as it's young, it seems fairly cohesive. Mm -hmm. It seems like there hasn't been a um, contentious issue. Oh, I, we we talked about this recently. Actually, I want to I want to get your thoughts on it again. Um, yeah. Do you think, could you think of off the top of your head, any issue that you might be able to propose on Cosmos that would split people fairly well uh, in the governance thing? Like a real contentious thing where you'd get, you know, almost half and half on either side. There is one proposal that, uh, yeah, so there's a situation where, okay, the Cosmos fundraiser happened in April 2017, right? And how it worked was people with Bitcoin addresses and Ethereum addresses were able, they put a... In Bitcoin, they put it in the op return. In Ethereum, they put it in the data field. And they sent a transaction with their Cosmos address to the uh, fundraiser contracts. And they were expected to keep that seed from their uh, fundraiser, right? A lot of them lost it. And I don't know about a lot, but I think I know of at least three people who have lost their seed for the Cosmos address. And some people have basically reached out saying, I still have access to my Bitcoin address oh, wow. that made the transaction. Now, can we create a system such that, let's say the, that corresponding Cosmos address never makes a transaction for a period of some challenge period, let's say a year, right? After that point, can I sign a message with my old Bitcoin address showing that I, you know, I'm claiming that account? And so... It's a sort of a fund recovery, but you know, a cryptographically provable style one. Um, it's it's almost so okay. So so let's for a sec consider the differences between this fund recovery and like Ethereum fund recovery. Sure. That has been talked about in the past. So yeah. let's take the Ethereum fund recovery as I send address. The parity one, right? Uh, yeah. Let's talk about the parity one. Okay. Um, it seems like so. Imagine that I had money in a multi sig. Mm -hmm. And that multisig got killed during some parody thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I am able to prove control over said multisig, right? Yes. Using, again, the same kind of cryptographic proof. Do you Correct. think, isn't it, isn't it the case that this is almost exactly the same? That in the same way you have a, you had authority over the coins, it's clear you didn't mean to lose them because it's the parody. No, attack. because there's a situation that uh, here, the attack here is let's say someone actually has a Cosmos address right? And their Bitcoin address got compromised. Their private key for their Bitcoin address got compromised and stolen by an attacker. Now, let's say they never make a transaction on Cosmos. And now that Bitcoin hacker who took their private Bitcoin private key can claim their atoms now as that's, well. That's exactly the same with the Ethereum example. If I, if I lost my funds in some sense and I lose access to my or someone else gains access to my Ethereum multi-sig signing things. No, can, because, again, because the parity the parity fund recovery, how would you know the multi-sig has some private keys associated with it, right. right? And it would be the private keys that it would be the private keys of that multi-sig that would have to unlock it. In this oh, situation, it it's would be like thing. as if we allowed it. So the the owner of the Bitcoin, the the address that created that parity multi-sig, he's allowed to withdraw those funds, right? I see. That would be different. Kind of. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, it's a, it's like a, a, a it's a time thing. It's yes. when the, the the keys were associated with the thing mm -hmm. that allows them to recover. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, that's fair enough. I personally am in favor of this proposal. I think that if someone doesn't make a transaction on Cosmos for over a year and they got their Bitcoin private key stolen, yeah, I mean, tough you know, love. Tough what, love. Tough love, yeah, honestly. Like, you, the purpose of Cosmos is that people are expected to be active participants in the network, and if you're not doing that and you got your key stolen, it's like, eh, you, know, I, you know, I agree that there's an attack here, but I think that this comes down to a, a theoretical versus practical situation. And it, given, given that there's probably mm -hmm. not very many people who lost their key, and there's also not very many people who, lose, who get their Bitcoin keys stolen, it seems unlikely that there's very much overlap. Correct. Um, and 
I don't know. I, but there are some some people, even within the Tendermint team, uh, who are very against this. And so I actually had during the Cosmos launch party, we had these like live debates on stage. <laughs> and so one of the ones we had was on this. And so you know maybe I want to chop it up. Like we'd post that on Conspiratus as well. Oh, that'd be dope. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I'd love to see that for sure. Cool. Um, and to ask your opinion on another thing, mm-hmm. are you are you similarly pro uh, Ethereum fund recovery or no? Specifically in the 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 parody case. And so we'll pick up with this question on the next episode of Conferatus, where we'll talk about some of the pressing issues and debates within the Ethereum community, some of the ideas around the culture of core developers speaking out against the issues that they find in the project uh, across different blockchain ecosystems. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the makeup of the MakerDAO project and how much how what its control over Ethereum governance is and then delve into a little bit about the Cosmos approach to multi-chain governance. So uh, check in next time for the rest of this uh, part two of this episode. Thank you.